Sante Sana, my son, this is my spiritual son, Jehudi El Malik Aman Ra, and I am indeed elated by, overjoyed actually, at the fact that we are able, number one, to publish another author other than myself, because I'm just not able to meet the market demand no matter how hard I try. And I am so happy that the, this uh, author is Jehudi because of the spirit and dedication he brings to his work. So you will be in store for a great treat uh, in terms of information that will expand your Afrocentric consciousness with this uh, piece, Shattering the Myth of the Man Who Freed the Slave. I know I've been very excited by it. So we are planning to publish it the early part of January, so look for it. How you doing this evening? Well, I'm glad you came out. I know this is not African weather, and it's difficult for Africans to move around in this kind of environment. And uh, although 40,000 years ago we were all up in Europe and everywhere, I never could understand why, how we did it, but we did it. And we built uh, a lot of things and great civilization up there. I, I don't think I could have made it with that group. I had to stay home where it was warmer. But it's good that you did come out, and uh, we're going to be able to share some things with each other tonight. I want to give thanks to uh, Brother Jehudi for acknowledging the Creator, which gives us the power and the source to be here to prepare that. I want to give special thanks to Head Start Bookstore, which I have a place of affection in my heart that is just very big. For I have a big heart and I have a great capacity for love for black people. Let me make that very clear. I have a very, and I'm not excusing that. I have a great capacity. And once I get finished with that, I don't have nothing else left. See. I have a great capacity for love for, my, for African people. And the uh, Fritz and Sheila and Brother Hotep and the folk here I always love coming here. They have a specialness about them. Many times, uh, because of the influence we have as a result of the conditioning, being here in the land of the beast, and taking on his ways often when we're not aware, we think in the process of doing business, you have to be hard, cold, and detached from one another. That is not the African nature. We were the ones who invented the concept of doing business, and we were always able to keep a warmth, a love, a humanity about it. And I, one of the things I like about working with them is their humanity in doing business. And so I'm, I'm honored to be here with them tonight and for this to be the first book party to uh, set off the introduction, to introduce uh, African woman, the original guardian angel. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be pretty casual this evening in sharing this information with you, and I hope there's a lot of uh, interchange in terms of question and answer from the floor. That's what I'm kind of looking forward to. Uh, plus, coming off of the road, and I, I, I think I might have gotten an hour's sleep, so hey, I need some of your energy <laughs> to keep going. We're, we're going to share and do it together. I want to begin by uh, first giving you some background on how we came up with this title and the concept for this particular publication. As you well know, I have been working, I think, on the last five years on maybe six different books. And every time I'd get in the middle of one, I'd have to stop and go teach or go do something else. Some uh, uh, economic situation would demand my attention. And beings we don't have, we're not underwritten by <laughs> any of the great foundations, you have to go give it that attention. Well, fortunately, we were able to raise enough for me to take a complete year off to write, which is exactly what I did. And I worked on this piece, African Genesis and Historical Reality. I thought I would be able to finish it in two months. I've been working on it all year. I've, I've, I've completed it. Uh, it stretched from what I thought would be about 12 chapters to 28 chapters. The first chapter in the book stretched out into seven chapters. We go all the way back to 4.6 billion years ago and work our way up to 18,000 BCE uh, in the, the development and growth of the world. And we present the creation of the world from the two basic concepts, the theory of evolution and the theory of creationism. And we're not selling either one of them. We just present them and we leave it up to the reader. But they're both presented in an Af from an Afrocentric perspective. In the course of doing this, in the process of, of, of my research for this work, 
I kept running into something that reminded me of a statement by Godfrey Higgins in the book Anacalypsis, when he says that every time he went to research the origin of anything, he always ended up at something black. I mean, he wrote that line when it seemed like an utter frustration. You can't go anywhere, and I'm using this term affectionately, without bumping into niggers. There's no way you can do that. No way. Every time I go to study anything, I bump into black folks. And kind of, uh, uh, a little different in my perspective was this. I wasn't frustrated by it. In fact, I grew spiritually. I developed and expanded in consciousness. Every time I went delving deeper into the history of African people and the history of the world, which is the history of African people, I always bumped into the black woman. There was no way to get around the black woman in this whole process. And as I looked at it very clearly, compared those things with Dr. Yusuf Ben Yochanan had introduced us to, he was the one that kind of led us back in that direction, and um, Sheikh Anta Diop and, and, and so many others in this rediscovery, because we're not discovering anything, in this rediscovery of this light, especially that uh, re relative to the African woman, I looked at it and I said, why, you, there is no world civilization without the African woman. The African man, and brothers don't take this as a put down, it's just a historical reality, could not have done it. It was her who set into motion. He was perfectly happy to hunt. And the play games, I mean, he was happy with it. He would not, he probably would not have advanced it beyond the hunter-gatherer stage. She did that. And we'll be discussing that as we go on. We, he, he was happy with what it, the way it was. All of this lectured everything you see that human beings value in terms of civilization. I'm not talking so much of the material as I'm talking about those spiritual elements, especially of civilization, are here because of the African woman. Now, for some brothers, that's a difficult thing to deal with. It's a blow to their ego if they don't understand that in recognizing that, you come to yourself. You come to know yourself. There's not a black man I know, there's still a black man, that does not love and revere his mother above all things. Why, your woman, you even call her what? Mama. That's an honorable title. White folks say, y'all still acting like children, you still call your women mother. She is my mother. So is my daughter. And I'm running a little ahead of myself. All females have, no matter what their relationship to your life, the mother role comes into play. And I will demonstrate that. If I fail to demonstrate that, remind me in the question and answer to do so. So as I went into that, I got to a point in African Genesis where I did two chapters, one entitled Sapphire Eve, Divine Mother of the Universal Egg. Then I went to another chapter, Rhapsody for the Glorious Queen of Heaven on the black woman. I said, because I got to do something special about the black woman here. Well, we finished African Genesis. I looked at it. I got about a 300, 400-page book with a bunch of illustrations and no money. I run out of money. <laughs> I got a book, but I have no way of taking it to press. So what I do is a thing that I carry all the way from the seminary, what we call taking it to the woods. So I took it to the woods. That is, I take it out and meditate. My church is in the woods. I, I'm not telling you where to worship or anything, you know. But that's where my best church is, in the woods. I feel closer to God in the woods. So I'll take it to the woods. And I took it to the woods. And I said, now, you got me through it. I appreciate that. The book is finished. And I really appreciate that. This was the ordeal. Now I don't have any money. What should I do? I don't know which way to go. I'm going to leave it with you, and I'll go back and work on what's at hand. I did just that. Like the old folks said, take it to the Lord and leave it there. After you've done everything you can. After what? You've done everything you can. Don't take it and leave it there from Jump Street. After you do everything you can, then you take it to the Creator, you take it to the ancestors, say, there it is. I'm going to work on this. And you don't sit down when you do it. You have to go immediately working on something else because in that something you will find what? The solution. That's where the solution is. Well, I had an order from a, a Baltimore store, the, uh, one of the Baltimore outlets, for some videotapes. So while I was sitting down editing up the videotapes, 
I came across this one on the seminar that, uh, uh, conducted in Richard Allen City, Miss Nomad, Philadelphia, where I uh, was talking about the African origin of angels and the concept of angels. I said, you know, this was some pretty good material. And I said, what we, then it came to me. Then the Spirit spoke to me. The Lord talked to me and said, Shak Moose, I said, what? See, this is what you do. You take the two chapters on the African woman and her creation of, I said, what? Creation of an ongoing contribution to world civilization. Put those with this piece on the angels and the piece you just delivered at Howard University on the last rites of passage, and this is what I want you to call it. I say, what you want me to call it? I say, name it African woman, the original guardian angel. I said, solid. We gave each other five, and I went on to work on it. <laughs> That's how it happened. I always get a Lord five, and he give me a solution. You know? <laughs> the Lord is hip, you know. Hip dude. So that's how we come into now. You take this, and when you publish that, that'll move, and that'll help you to raise the funds to go on with the larger work. That's how Angel came to pass. While working on uh, African Woman, the original Guardian Angel, which was an exciting experience, it was a joyful experience indeed, uh, I had this poster by uh, Cal Massey, artist Cal Massey, Angel Heart. Well, when I first started working on it, I didn't have the poster. One day, I was in a, another outlet delivering some materials, and I saw this poster si sticking from behind something. I was talking on the phone, and I stopped suddenly. They thought maybe I was having a heart attack or something. I kept saying, ah, ah, ah. They thought maybe I was, you know, having a seizure. I saw this picture, and I knew this has to go on the cover. And I'm going to call this artist and make him an offer he cannot refuse because we must have this sister on the cover. And, of course, fortunately, we were able to work out something. this beautiful piece. Well, while I was working, many times I would get tired in the process. And it would seem like to me that, and don't say nothing because you weren't there. I was the one there. She would come off the poster and fly around the room. And when I start dozing, she'd whack me with one of them wings. And I get back to work again. My wife started getting jealous. She said, now, wait a minute. I believe in extended the wife thing, that thing, but this woman taking everything. I don't get no time. She took over completely. And in the last few weeks of production, she possessed me. She also gave me the strength to go for 48 hours straight without sleep, which at 51 years old, I'm not inclined to do. But she carried me through all the way. What I'm talking about is not the post. I don't want you to, to think I've got a fetish with the, with the image. I'm talking about the concept, the energy, that spiritual energy that comes from the idea and concept of the African woman and her strength. My real African uh, woman and the angel was my wife and my babies, especially my little girl. That, actually, she owns me. She owns me. See? And they keep you going. So that uh, was how that experience uh, was taking place as we were working on this. The, I want to cover with you uh, a few thoughts on the chapters or the essays. What we did, we, we put them into essay form, a collection of essays here. I want to discuss some of that with you. And after so doing, I want to move on as quickly as we can to question and answer, comments and exchange. I would really prefer to do with that. How about you? All right, I, I'd really like to do that. Now, the introduction is titled, Black Woman, the Epitome of Wisdom in the Ancient World, of Beauty and Wisdom in the Ancient World. Between 40,000 and 200,000 years ago, and probably even further back, the standard of physical beauty all over the planet Earth was the Africoid features of the black woman. A feminine beauty. For male beauty, of course, was the African male. Her pronounced steel tapagia, ample posterior that causes brothers to say, mm, 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 Lord have mercy. 
when she walks down the street. The way she can make her skirt snap like no other woman in the world can. And then what they'll do with you is take you into these places for modeling, these schools for modeling, and tell you to walk with it tucked in. This is your mark of divinity. One of your marks of divinity. Never be ashamed of it. You know the brothers are not ashamed of it. You know the black men love it with all their heart and soul. You just have to learn how to love it spiritually as well as physically. But you're supposed to love it mentally, physically, and spiritually. Because it was with this cosmic mechanism that her body was made in that she was able to receive, sustain, nurture for 40 weeks of gestation the seed for new life and bring it forth into the world. That's one of the reasons why it was revered. Her kinky hair and her broad nose and thick lips were carved out of stone all over the world. As a matter of fact, when people died, they were afraid that if they died without making a particular preparation among the many other preparations for the last rite, there was one that you had to have or they believed in their system of belief about 100,000 years ago that you could not, and the only human beings on the planet 100,000 years ago were Africans, by the way, that you could not make it safely onto the other side, into the another world, unless you had buried with you an image of the African woman. And so they went in Europe, in France, in Europe, in Italy, in Europe, even up in Russia, all over there, they dig up these graves, they exhume these graves, and they find the deceased in the fetal position. The skeletal remains clutching to its chest an image of the black woman. Because he felt, as long as I had the spirit of this woman with me, I can make it safely to the other world. That's how the whole concept of angels began. That's where the whole idea came from. Because it was believed then, as it was for thousands of years by Africans, that at the point of death, it was the feminine energy in the cosmos because they realized there was a masculine and a feminine energy in the God force. You couldn't procreate anything even on the spiritual level without an exchange between the Om and the Um, or the Chinese call it the yin and the yang. That the one who had the closest contact with the creative force in the universe was the female. And at death, just like you came forth from her into life, you were received into the bosom of Mother Earth and the spirit of the divine feminine force in the universe would take you safely home. That's where the whole idea of angels taking you to glory came from. And it was about an, uh, the black woman. Why? Because the first thing, as Brother Jehudi just said, that man ever learned in his life was learned from his what? His mother. The very first thing, while he was still in her womb, the first paradise, the first heaven, as Dr. Ben says, and he puts, he uses another word, I, I do not feel free to use here. The first heaven that man knew anything about was the womb of woman. Carry you for 40 weeks, that's a long time. You are nourished by her. Her thoughts become your thoughts. Everything you, you your learning begins there in the womb. She transfers, and so when you come into the world, she already has somewhat established the perimeters of your personality, your being, and where you will go in life. She is the one that has set that from the beginning. Mother, that's the first heaven that anybody knew anything about in the world. That was the first symbol used in worship. The woman's vagina. Not because people were being, uh, what do they call that now, Pon pornographic? That's what you call it in the European world. It's because people look back and said, that's where I came from. That's how I got here. That must be, and what he could remember subconsciously from living there for nine months, that's the best place I've ever been. 
the most comfortable and the safest place I have ever been was there. So he spent the rest of his life trying to get back there symbolically. You have to understand the spiritual connection there. Well, then the black woman, most all black women, and I would dare say probably all, and I'm talking about about 100,000, 200,000 years ago, the date may vary, knew they were beautiful. They were the Ms. Universe, without a question. They knew that. They weren't attacking their hair and face and everything else. And I'm not picking on anybody. Believe I don't. I'm not doing that because you're my sister. You're my brother. I don't care. We still family, and I'm in love with you. And you make your own choices. But I'm saying they didn't feel the need to do that. They didn't feel the need to try to look like somebody else because they were very happy with the way they looked. And the black woman was overjoyed with the way she looked because the black man was constantly telling her how fine she was. I mean, why else would you go all over the world tripping out? Images of her in stone. And not only do you do it while you're alive, you go and take them to the death with you. Take them to the grave. Say, I do not want to leave this. Now, I don't want to take the live woman. That wouldn't be right. But I got to take something to remind me of what I, the joy I shared while I was on earth, the greatest joy that I've ever known while I was on earth. I have to take that with me. This is the way they believe. Not, not, don't just say, well, this brother is, I don't know if I can go. This is the way men thought 100,000 years ago. These were men who were creating civilizations and building great civilizations all over the world, up in England which I don't care that much for, but in France, and in Italy, and in Russia, and in India, and in the Americas, yes. All over the world. They were so inspired by the angel. In fact, one of the words for angel was genius. And that was to bespeak the fact that, and in the Arabs call it the genie. And that it was because she was the inspirational force that gave him the drive to do those things who want to conquer this, to do that, to achieve great things. The standard of beauty and wisdom all over the world was the African woman at that time. And she knew it quite well. One of the reasons why I set about writing this, because you have to question your purposes for what you do, is that I would love to see so much the black woman come to know who she is. For in so doing, I think it would alleviate a lot of her insecurities. And she would not feel the need to attack a man as often, and he would not feel the need to react to it. And he needs to know who she is, so that he won't mistreat her and misuse her abuse. Because when he does that, he messes up his karma. When you mess up your karma, when you mistreat your mother, you messed up spiritually. And your wife is your mother. Like this, times when you're her father. But she represents your mother at times as well. And if you mistreat any black woman, you have mistreated your what? Your mother. When you marry out of your race, you have insulted your mother. That's what you've done. And when you insult your mother, well, that's about the worst thing you can do. For Africans, anyway. About the worst thing you can do is insult your mother, and your mother will tell you, I brought you here. I'll take you away from here. If anybody can put the fear of God in you, she can. So, and what she went through to bring you here, that's something that is always amazing to me. And then after she goes through it, the next minute she's smiling and looking at you and saying, my baby, after you went through all of that. And then while I was writing, I thought about my own genetic mother who came to me several times in the process. She was a pretty black woman, pretty black big leg woman. That's why I got that fixation today. That's the first thing I saw when I came in the world. Them pretty black legs. When I came in the world, first thing I saw. Beautiful woman. They called her sister. And after sister brought me to, into the world, she joined the ancestors about a year later, there was some type of complication which developed. I never had any clear understanding on it. That was in some way connected with the birth process, it seemed. So she eventually ended up giving her life to give me life. And the thought of that 
just stayed with me all during this process. And I couldn't help but continue to thank her for that and to ask of her guidance so that I could be, do her honor and justice. That's why she's one of the people who I dedicated this book to, the very first one, because she made it possible for me to be here to write one in the first place. That whole process. But she, the thing that, uh, as Diop says, there's nothing that an African mother will not do for her child. There's nothing too great for her to go do. And I mean, even when they wrong and mess up, you see mothers hanging over, that's my child. That's my boy. And, and uh, in most uh, societies, in some uh, societies on the continent in ancient times, if you messed up too bad, the mother would go after you. And if you really hurt the community, she would take you out. She would go on the hunt to find you, and she would take you out. That's some kind of a system, isn't it? That's a hard, but it was a righteous system. When you made you taking you to that point where your mother come after you, the very person she brought into the world and gave life, that means you're supposed to what? Leave here. You're supposed to go. You're supposed to be gone. Because you're dangerous to everything, including yourself. You're supposed to be out of here. She would take care of that for you. Essay one, an Afrocentric perspective on the origin of angels. You all right? Yeah, all right. You still with me? In that essay, we deal with the fact that the first introduction that we had to angels, and the word angel, let me define the word. It comes from several different languages. The one that we use in the English language today is from the Greek angelos. And it's from the Arabic malik and from the Hebrew Malak, as you, you read in your, your Old Testament Bible, which means messenger. And originally, that's all it meant. It didn't mean a superhuman being. It meant someone who carried a message from one place to another. Usually, it was a very important message from some dignitary to the people. That was called a messenger. Now, how was this appellation attached so strongly to the African woman. Because in the ancient system of belief, that's in India, that's everywhere that I can think of where African people were, and they were everywhere. It was thought that it was the black woman who carried the message or your request to the gods or to the ancestors that she could get things done better than anyone else. Why did they think that way? Let's look at, look at it historically. First of all, while man was in a stage, the hunter-gatherer stage, going shopping for groceries was a very dangerous business. You could be groceries or you could give groceries. <laughs> it was a toss-up. Depending upon what mood the line was in when you got there. If the lion was hungrier than you, you'd probably end up being the groceries. But if not, you may bag the lion and bring him home. Well, now, there's a lot of hazard involved in that occupation. And so for a woman to see a man go out, and her sons go out every day, and not know if they're going to come back or not from the shopping mall, she said, I got to come up with something to minimize uh, the uh, cost or the risk involved in survival, in the survival game. I have to take the survival game to another level. I have to evolve it to another level. So what did she do? She came up with the concept of agriculture. That came from woman. Black woman was the first one to plant a seed in the ground to grow something. So when the blood come home, dragging the lion and everything, and the village is rejoicing, and they take it to the women so they can dress it and fix it. She said, baby, I got something for you to go with your lion meat steak tonight. What you got, baby? I got some uh, lima beans and corn. Say, well, what you call that? Mama said, that's succotash. Say, and I got me some sweet potatoes, some yams. Go ahead. Say, try it out, honey. Yeah, he said, Lord, baby, this is good. She said, well, you know, this is good, healthy food, and if you don't want to, you don't have to go out and hunt tomorrow. You can stay around the village and fix up some things. Do something else. You don't have to go out there. Well, baby, how are we going to eat? I got the succotash and I got these taters. Then later on, he come home one time and she had baked up this 
big thing, round thing, put it on the table. He said, what's that? She said, that's bread. That's the, gonna be the staff of life. If you don't have nothing else, if you got this, made out of the right grains, why you can be healthy and live if you never catch a line again. He said, you mean to tell me, baby, if I never go back out there again, after that line, I can live healthy and eat in the family kitchen. She said, yeah, honey. That's what this is. And that's how the system develops. She said, now you can sit your behind now, start running and chasing things, and figure out how to get something done. What them things up there blinking in the sky is, what they mean. And that's how astronomy started. He couldn't sit still in the stadium long enough. He was too busy chasing food. He was concerned about his stomach. She took him from his biological being now to another stage, to his mental stage, and then put him in touch with his spiritual self. As long as you're chasing after something biological, and you're caught up in the survival, the, the proclivities of survival, it's difficult for you to rise beyond the stage of the beast that you're chasing. You get a blood lesson, you start taking on the personality of that animal after a while. Because when you fight the lion, you got to have his spirit. So the cat after a while was starting to get confused about himself. He couldn't tell whether he was a beast or a man. The civilizing factor was the black woman. So she sat him down. And he started asking questions about things and studying things. And that was the beginning of education. She also got tired of wandering all over every place. And she said, this is what we're going to do, baby. I'm going to build us a house. He said, well, what's that? She said, watch me. He come home one day, has this big round thing sitting there. With a way to get in, smoke to get through the chimney. She said, we can stay nice and warm here when it gets cold. There's a place to protect the children. He said, well, baby, why you make it round like that? She says, extension of my womb. And that's why in Africa today, we find houses built on the round. In many societies that are culturally, spiritually advanced, you will find houses built in the round. Then she took the houses and put them in a village, and she built that in the what? Round. When you look at Great Zimbabwe, it's built in exactly the shape of the female vagina. And the tower sits there just like the clitoris in the female vagina, because it was an extension of her. That's how the whole concept of the city came about. As a matter of fact, in the Kemetan language, misnomered uh, Egyptian, in hieroglyphics, the same sign used for house is the same sign used for mother. The city of Paris in France, whenever a white person says to you, or even mentions the word Paris, say, did you give thanks to the black woman? Now, he'll be absolutely confused before you explain to him what you mean. Because when you open your mouth and say Paris, you are actually giving praise to the black woman. It comes from the word Parsi, which comes from the Kemetan Par, which means house of Isis. That's where the city came from. It was the city of Isis. And it has a boat in its coat of arms, which is a symbol of Isis, who moved across the primal waters and brought forth life. That is what her proper name is, Arset. The Greeks call her Isis. So just that, that one thing, that city, speaks to the glory of the African woman. Now what they do in it doesn't, but it, the name of it gives you some idea of the glory of the African woman and why she was so precious. So now, because she was the first to establish an alphabet, a system of writing. This is how I document this very well. You know, Brother Shaka don't write nothing. He can't argue it. You know that. I just didn't know that's why it takes so long to do it. But I know you're going to ask me where I got it from, and I want to tell you where I got it from. And I didn't put all the documentation I could have put in. You wouldn't get in the book at all. The, all of those things that are the basis for civilization that man was able to move forward from came from her. Now, I'm running a little ahead of myself. Are you still with me? Am I confusing you? Because I'm tripping over myself here a minute. Let me move on with this Afrocentric perspective of angels. The first concept we got of it was in church, most of us. And so, and, 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 and the imagery connected with it was some blonde-haired, blue-eyed, effeminate-looking male. There were no male angels in the ancient world. When Europeans came into power, 
with their patrilineal and misogynistic and uh, ambiguous sexual dimorphism and uh, what's that thing called? Sexual maladjustment. All the things that Michael Bradley said, they go to all these uh, phobias and uh, schisms and isms and, and pathologies. They go through with women. I mean, white men have a problem with women. They really do. And the reason why they have a problem with the woman is because they could not do what the woman could do. They did. They were jealous of the fact that a woman could have a baby and they couldn't. Yes, they did. And they found that that method didn't work for them back then. <laughs> They're trying to test tube now. They tried to do it physically. If they could have done without the woman, wait, I'm running ahead of myself. Let me hold that point. Somebody hold that point. Sister, hold that point for me. <laughs> For a long time, they thought that the conception of the child was totally the prerogative of the female. They didn't even understand at all the male role in it. They were just getting something. They didn't know what it was doing. That's put it in there, they were just getting something. They had no concept of the spiritual connection there whatsoever. It seems now, as I look in historically, the African understood this at a very early period and based the whole scientific structure and their symbolism off of it. In fact, every symbol of religion can be traced back to the woman's body. Every symbol of religion. Let me give you an example. I know I'm jumping around quite a bit. All right. But the book will straighten it up for you. <laughs> Let's take now the Star of David which is the Sri Yantra of Hindu Kush, brought there by the Kushites in India, in the Undis Valley. The Sri Yantra, the double triangle, is a symbol of the female vagina and the interchange between the male and the female in the act of copulation, which was a divine act in those days, when nothing nasty, evil, shameful about it. It was a divine act when man and woman came together because the forces of the universe were moving you. And out of that could come new life. That was a divine happening. Unfortunately, it's been so debased today. And one of the reasons why we write about this and put emphasis on it is with the hope that African people will get back into the sanctity of it and not be ashamed of it and approach each other with the wholeness and soundness of mind wherein they can take it beyond a biological level. And therefore, they will get the total benefits of the act. Now, white folks talking about celibacy and all that. Africans need exchange mentally, spiritually, and physically. And they need those things to be harmonized with one another. Now, I'm not saying that you should run around promiscuously bed hopping. I don't mean that. I'm saying there needs to be a sane balance with African males and females with that sharing of one another. And there's also understanding the sanctity and the sacredness of it. The female must always be approached in the spirit of that sanctity and holiness. And she must never be left unfulfilled. That was a sacrilege in the ancient world. No African male would ever think of doing that. No way to partake of his pleasure of a woman and leave her unfulfilled. That was absolutely unheard of. As a matter of fact, once it happened, once them sisters got finished talking, why, you had to move. <laughs> the elders got you and said, come on, boy, we need to talk to you. But they had a system whereby in their male and female training in the secret societies where they prepared you for that. How to take love, how to give love, how to exchange love, so that you could be totally fulfilled and that the experience would go beyond the biological and you would see God. I mean, I don't see how you can get closer to the Creator than when you're hanging between life and death at that moment. You know what I'm talking about. You're between life and death. Now, if it lasted any longer, you could have your heart stopped. <laughs> so you hanging between life and death. You see God right then. And if you approach it in that way, it's so beautiful, and, it, and it's rejuvenating, and it, it gives you the strength to go on. I hope you understand the spirit in which I'm saying this. I know you understand the spirit in which Dr. Ben said, because he, he, he don't cut no, his mouth don't know no Sunday, as he say about it. That's all. <laughs> I try to be a little polite about it, not to say that he isn't. 
when Dr. Ben's reputation is so secure, he just says it. So, <laughs> uh, that, uh, of course, let me get back. Now, what was that I asked you to hold for me, sister? The uh, test tube. Oh. We were working on test tube babies and then trying to bring babies into the world of cells with males. Oh, and right. Oh, there would probably be no white females on the planet Earth today if it were not for the fact that the only way you can extend yourself and procreate is with the female. If he could have found a way to do it with the male, she would have been gone a long time ago. They have hated women from the very beginning. They noticed there was a difference between them. They suffer from that, that's called that dimorphism, ambiguous sexual dimorphism. A hatred of anything different from themselves, even though it comes out of their same species. But they have a hatred of that gender and a jealousy of that gender. And because they didn't have, because that was seen in the world as a powerful thing, how can you carry something for all that time, survive all that pain, bring it into the world? How do you do that? I mean, that's miraculous. If for no other reason, that causes me to believe in the Creator, because I can't think of it. There's got to be a divine intelligence to put together something like that. Something like that just does not happen. That's the most marvelous mechanism there is on earth. Nothing more marvelous than that. And he looked at that, he said, well, how come she has the power to do it and I don't? The African male said, well, solid sister, I'm sorry to see you go through all that and I'm going to be here for you. <laughs> but since the Lord blessed you with it, you got it, you know. And I'm thankful that you're here. He was jealous. He even went through rituals where he castrated himself, thinking that if he bled like she bled, he would have the power. Now, don't take my word for it. Here's a book to read. Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets by Barbara G. Walker. Read that. And she, cut, she comes from a Eurocentric point of view, but I know how to put it in an Afrocentric point of view, and you do, because of your background and understanding. But they, that was the problem. When God Was a Woman is another book. And the great mother. The white male, the European male, was jealous of the female, and he still is. Because he could not decide because of his uh, sexual maladjustment, his psychological sexual maladjustment, he couldn't decide whether he wanted to be male or female. At one time, it was very clear to the African, before we became influenced by others, what the role was. And we were very happy and satisfied with those roles. The women with theirs, the men with theirs, because they were equal roles. One did not subject to subdue the other. Even in the matrilineal system, there was more fairness in that system Men fared better in the matrilineal system than they ever fared in the patrilineal system. In the patrilineal system, the woman was subdued. And he didn't fare any better because it's an aggressive system that has men bloodletting and fighting one another. It's of European origin. Men lived longer in the matrilineal system. Men lived happier in the matrilineal system. They enjoyed more in the matrilineal system. It was the African woman in the matrilineal system who developed the system of polygyny. Say, honey, we need some help. You need more than one woman. Here, let's do that. She came up with that. She gave you everything you had. It made life worth living. But in the patrilineal system, those things that were nurturing, those things that developed you spiritually, that made you want to build pyramids, make you want to search the stars, make you want to expand mathematics into a cosmic infinity level, no longer existed. It's just brute force. The strongest survive over the weakest, so to speak. If you had the physical strength to take it, it's yours by right. That is what their system was based on. It's still based on that today. And for all their talk of law and justice is still based on who has the power to take it from another person. That was one of the great differences there. Now, this idea of angels, therefore, did not come from Christianity, did not come from the Hebrews, did not even come from Islam. Y'all don't get angry with me because I'm not picking on anyone's religion. Please, understand that. And don't let this difference of opinion we may have on this be a point of separation between us. That I would, you know, I really do not want to happen. I just have to state it according to the way as I see it, according to historical research. You know, in tune with that historical research. You don't necessarily have to agree with it, but this is the way it came. Though the concept of the angel did not begin there, and they were not male, they were female. 
It began where then? I think that takes us to the next essay. It began with the Nubian Grimaldi, is what I called them. They called them the Grimaldi that the uh, remains they dug up in uh, Grimaldi, Italy. Uh, that's where they first, in the uh, 1800s, mid-1800s, began to dig up these Africoid remains, which date between 40 to 100,000 years ago. And they named them Grimaldi, which is improper, because they were from Nubia. They were Nubians. So I call them Nubian Grimaldi to identify the place where they first began to exhume them, to excavate them, and to identify who they actually were. They were Nubians. They were from the continent of Akebu land, Misnomad Africa. That's where they were from. And they built a marvelous civilization which cannot be in any way claimed by the Cro-Magnon who came about 10 or 20,000 years after he comes up out this ice mysteriously. You know, I'm probably developing out of the Neanderthal or something. It's still a mystery to where he came from. And I'm not being hateful, but this is true. We know that the system of life in the world was far more peaceful and harmonious before he came than after he came. Now, if you don't believe that, look at the world today that we live in. And look at the history of Europeans in, con in, in uh, connection, in relationship to peoples of color. That speaks for itself. I mean, it's very obvious. So I'm not talking about it hatred or anything, I'm making an historical assessment. I'm making an assessment of a situation based on historical information. All right. Well, they, some of these figurines, these Africoid figurines with these uh, voluptuous figurines that were buried with the deceased had wings, which was a symbol of the concept of being born spiritually from this life to the next. It was a very heavy, deep concept there. Uh, that we have yet to do much more research upon. Now we have angels in the world projected uh, as uh, neuters. They're neither male nor female, according to Judeo-Christian uh, uh, theology and philosophy. They're neither male nor female. They totally corrupted the whole point. I mean, they don't make any point anymore. They're, they're just mythological beings. They're fantasy beings. So when your guardian angel is with you, you won't get hurt. But how come so many devout Christians die in car accidents and things like that? That's the question I have to ask, if that's what the meaning of an angel is. That's a practical reality. I'm not attacking belief. I'm just asking why, if that's the case. Obviously, angel means something else. Essay 2. Angels in Ancient Kemetan High Culture. And as I was researching it, I kept seeing these winged creatures over the head of the pharaohs. Remember seeing those in the pictures? Over the head of the pharaohs. And then when I saw the one with the head of Osset on it, whom they missed Nama Isis, then I got the picture. I understood. This was the protecting angel over the pharaoh. She protected him from his enemies. She gave him inspiration to rule with wisdom. I went further in studying the iconography of ancient Kemet, misnomered Egypt, excuse me. <coughs> and I see this picture of Osset. I like this one better. Let me show you this one. I see this picture of Osset on this side and Nephthys or Nebuchadnezzar on that side. With angels' wings. I say, hey, hold it. That's where the concept come from. These black women with angel wings protecting the pharaoh. The one has a throne on her head, which we'll talk about, on her headdress, and the other has the incense burner. We'll talk about that too. Over the top there is Het Heru, misnomered by the Greeks Hathor. That's who is represented there. Also, it is represented in the feminine, I mean in the masculine form, as Pata, the Pata beetle. But it also stands for Het Haru, because this symbology of ancient Kemet, or what I call the astro-mythological scientific symbology of ancient Kemet, was so heavy and profound that these things, will, we may never know them all in this lifetime. 
That's how you, you're talking about an empire that lasted 18,000 years and just constantly developing and creating these scientific symbols. They didn't bow down and worship these things. These were symbols of natural forces. In African Genesis 2, entitled, in the beginning was, uh, oh no, African Genesis 2, Black Gods in the Land of uh, Eden, I, go, I trace many of these gods and goddesses back to the original African kings and queens they were named after. These were people who actually lived, who represented certain principles of life and natural phenomena demonstrated in what they did for the people. Now, looking at this picture done by Brother Mentu Tegut, it's a favorite, we keep it hanging in our living room. And it's a blessing just to look upon. Here now is all set with the throne on her head. Why does she have a throne on her head? Because the throne represented the lap of your mother. Why? Because it was the woman who established the system of governance. And it's she who made king. She was the king maker. She gave him the power to be the king. You are the front line of defense between me and the outside world. Not to say that women couldn't have come. You got some bad warrior queens, man. She preferred, in most cases, I'll take care of the domestic front. I will continue to develop civilization, writing, art, uh, I will do music, uh, 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 mathematics, uh, agriculture. I will continue to develop all of these things. You rule and take the throne and protect it. I'll develop the marketplace. She was, there was no Wall Street without her. Whenever you see them down on Wall Street, remember, you created that. One say, I'll take you to beans with the, with the, the taters and they were switching it up. That's where the first barter came. The first trading system came about. And then she began to sophisticate it with cowrie seeds. Selling 10,000 yams at 20 calories per. And they were switching up. And they, could, and they were swifter than the folks on Wall Street. Now, I don't know how they understand what they're doing out in the pits. They have to be She was swifter than that. Because the African woman could carry around in her head the whole inventory of a shop. And African shops can get quite cluttered. In her head, the whole inventory of 35 or 40 shops. The Dahomey woman was famous for doing that. That's how good she was. She developed the whole system. She was the most highly intelligent being on earth. And when she transferred that intelligence to man. Not to say that he didn't have the capability. I didn't mean that. She was the one that made him more aware of it. And the times that she really made him aware of it was in those inspirational moments that they were together. When you came together in the midnight hour, you were supposed to come back from that experience with more than a physical release. You were supposed to come back elated, elevated. The Kemetan priest said man could not know God until he had known woman totally. That was the only way he could know God. And it was in, they had a practice called myathuna. That's, now if you want to ask me the question and answer, I'll be glad to deal with it. That was a complex system of that whole relationship between the male and female. Well, she gave him the power of the throne. In fact, I have a, a picture in here of Setai One sitting on Aset's lap on the day of his coronation because she was the one who gave him the power of the throne, his mother. And I explain that in, in, in depth and in detail here in the book, uh, African Woman, the Original Guardian Angel. Why, even in the Bible, when Ezekiel had a vision of the divine intelligence of God as they missed Narim, he was sitting on a what? A sapphire throne. Why? <laughs> We'll go into the word sapphire there. Read the book. You'll find out about it. She represented the source of power to rule. And Nebuchadnezzar, or Nepta as some call her, had the incense burner, which was the spiritual essence. She gave him the spiritual inspiration and energy. She gave him the power. And had her rule took him up to higher levels of beauty and, and, and tranquility and aesthetic so he could bring it all together into one and rule with mercy and with love. That is what this symbolizes, some of what it symbolizes. The depth of it we just cannot go into here tonight. I'm going to be finishing in a minute and open the floor because I can see the anxiousness on your face. You want to ask some questions. Am I, am I right in that? 
Well, I think I just discussed essay three, safe and secure in the wings of black angels, which is uh, uh, where we describe the uh, sonography and iconography of uh, ancient Kemet. And also in the resurrection scene of uh, Osa, Miss Melman Osiris. Who's there bringing him to life? Jesus? No. Standing at his head is Osset. Standing at his feet is Nebethet. And over top of him in the form of a hawk bird is Heteru. Those sisters gave him life. Brought him back to life. That was a symbol of the fact that when a man sinks so low, it is the warmth and divine inspiration of woman who can bring him back to himself. His mother, the mother force in his life. And I said, yes, every woman in your life is your mother to some degree. Even your daughter. Who reminds me to take my medicine when I should take it? My daughter. What kind of role is that? That's a mother role. And your sister. Put your coat on, bruh. What is that? Mother role. There. Every, asp uh, every woman plays a mother to you in some form or fashion because of her maternal instinct, which is the strongest instinct on the planet. Sometimes you may get by the man, but if the child is in danger, you may not get by that woman. That's of every animal species. The male lion, he sounds bad, he looks bad. But the one who really takes care of business when those children are hungry is what? The female lion. Because that's that one argument. Like my wife runs the business, and I'm happy for her to run the business because she has an argument that no one can refuse. I got babies to feed. Not that I don't realize that we have them to feed, but she hears before I do what? I'm hungry. And she feels that more intensely. Then not that I don't feel it. I feel it. Make me going to knock somebody in the head and take something. You know, I'm just saying that as a joke. I wouldn't do that, especially not to my people. <laughs> but she feels that, and she'll tell you, honey, something's got to be done. And if you try, you can see a woman who would normally be delicate, maybe like, and, and, and seem so sweet and wouldn't hurt a fly, and you're going to mess with her baby and see what you got to deal with. That's that mother force, that strength there. Essay four, Sapphire Eve, divine mother of the universal A. Now, the sapphire was a very precious stone in ancient times. And I know that it has a negative connotation to it in today's world. But whenever a black man calls you sapphire, that's an affectionate term. Even when he's talking about it in terms of it has a dual meaning. It's your sweetness, your preciousness, your value, and then there's other meaning when you're evil and got your habits on. And you get to acting evil. But even then, it's meant what? Affectionately. Sapphire. And that's why we put that sapphire Eve there. And I go into the explanation of why that is. Eve is the code name used by scientists for the mother of all. And of course, they took it from the book of Genesis, from the Genesis story of a uh, uh, cosmogonical story, which is just one of the many, which I discuss in African Genesis and historical reality. The uh, Eve that they... Uh, have rediscovered now is the mother of all living on earth that all people can be traced back to this group of black women on the continent the mother continent the southern portion of the mother continent this black woman this what they miss now a hot and tight woman this woman the mother of the world everybody's mother i know some of them you don't want no more to claim but she is everyone's mother 200,000 years ago, she was the only homo sapien on earth producing children. This black woman. And her mitochondrial DNA survived everything else around her and became the source of all other life. No wonder the whole world worshipped her at one time. Now, when Dr. Ben first taught me this, I walked the street for two weeks in a quandary. I couldn't get it together when he said there was a mother God before there was a father God. And I walked around, I couldn't figure that out. 
saved my life. How could this be? After all, I came up in the seminary, and I've always heard of Father God, and my image was, uh, even when I uh, 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 embraced the Afrocentric image, it was always of a jet black male with white, you know, hair all over the ancient of days. And I, This is what I pictured. He said, no, before there was a Father God, there was a Mother God. And I said, how could this be? Then he went on to explain to me scientifically that man's, concept of God was that which gave him what? Life! That which nourished and sustained him was his concept of God. He didn't have any understanding of the divine intelligence beyond that point. That's why some people were bowing down worshiping totems of things which they ate. Why? Because that thing, what? Fed them. And if God can do anything, God can what? Feed you. That determines who your God is. And for many black people today who have such a great profession of faith, I find that when they put in a jam where that faith is tested or they got to do what that white man tell them to get that paycheck, God comes up on the short end. Which says in one tape, one message I did, black folks need to stop worshiping the white man and start serving God. Because in many instances, that's what we're doing. Because the person who writes your paycheck or controls your protein, can cut off your protein source, is the person that gets your honor and worship. That's why it's so hard for them to cut them images of white deities loose. Here's a big church. I passed one the other day. Big church. Built by the blood, sweat, and tears of black folks. White folks ain't put a dime in it. Black minister, black usher, bold, black everything. You walk in the if you look, now you don't even walk in the church. You look through the glass door. Here's this big white faggot standing there with his hands outstretched. Come on to me. I am your salvation. Said, so now if that isn't insanity, I don't know what is. I'm not attacking anyone's belief. I don't mean to do it. Let, let, I mean, let's, let's just examine that logically. How do you put your blood and your sweat in the building or something and then take somebody else's picture and put it on it? See, he did it. All to him I owe. Wasn't for him. I was white boy, put it down and give damn whether you put it built in or not. It doesn't make him no difference. That's all you came to work Monday morning. That's just But the first concept of any deity or divinity on earth was that of the black woman. That was the first concept. Because that's all man knew about it first. This is where I came from. This is what nourished me. This is what sustained me. This is what held me out of breast all these years. This is it. My father taught me true, and I appreciate my father. I revere my father. The first thing I ever learned, I learned from my mama. I told you that the religious symbols can be traced back to her body. I talked about the star and the David, or what, or what should be uh, the Mogan David, as they call it, the, the, the Hebrews, and they co-opted it, but it should have been called the Sri Yantra. There's also the star and the crescent. Uh-oh, Muslims, please don't get angry with me. I'm just stating a historical point. And folks can get kind of, uh, this, their uh, religious sensibilities can, you know. And I understand, you know, we, we have our system of belief, but you should be secure enough in it that you can entertain other ideas about it other than that which is generally taught in the, the doctrine of, 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 of your particular uh, system of belief. And the thing is, in the Star and the Crescent, the moon was always the symbol of the black woman. In fact, you wouldn't have a calendar today if it wasn't for the connection that Africans made between the phases of the moon and the cycle of the woman's body. The 28-day cycle that comes every, what the different things sisters call it now, 28-day cycle that comes is in harmony with the movement of the 28-day cycle of the moon. So they built the calendar off of that, the way her body moved. Why in the Bible do you hear it rained 40 days and 40 nights. They spent 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus went on a 40-day fast. Why were they so preoccupied with the number 40? Because that's how long you stay in the mother's womb, the average child, 40 weeks. Everything traced back to that. And of course, the star of heaven. She was once depicted as, and she still is, on many of the great temples in our land there. Depicted with her body uh, outstretched, hands on the ground, 
here feet on the ground giving birth to the sun every day the sky the stars in the sky she was connected with the sky she was connected with all of the aspects of nature the earth the sky all of it that is some of the things of, of, of where the star and the crescent comes from it gets even deeper than that goes even uh, uh, even deep, but it's connected with the correlation between the African woman's body and the phases of the celestial heavens and the forces of nature. Because they saw her as a microcosm of the microcosm of the total cosmos. And that's why they called it what? Mother Nature. The only people I know have a fatherland are them crazy Germans. Everybody else has a motherland. The earth has always been associated with the mother force. And here this nut who has problems with his own sexuality has a fatherland. Divine Mother of the Universal Egg. Now the egg is a symbol, always has been a symbol of life and regeneration. Why? Because the ancient high culture scientists of the Kushites and the Kemetan knew very early in the development of civilization that there was a connection between a chicken egg, or a correlation between a chicken egg, a snake egg, and the ovaries in the woman's body, that they all spelled what? New life, the giving of life. So they came up in a way of describing the scientific principle by showing Ptah sitting at a potter's wheel shaping the cosmic egg, which was to demonstrate the male role, seminal role, in the implanting of the seed into the womb of woman and to meet with the egg to bring forth new life. They had an understanding of this that far exceeds anything man knows today. What they know today is Mickey Mouse by comparison. And I dare say, I do honestly believe that the embracing of this knowledge and the, the, the going back into the depth of it is a key towards us helping to further unlock our consciousness so that we will no longer be limited by the parameters set by a people who have never grown up and whose history show that they will never be able to grow up. Because they have at their fingertips the resources of the world, and instead of using them for the good of humanity, they use them for the destruction of humanity. Anytime you have all of this, and people are still starving, and wars are still going all over the world, and dope is riddling in communities like it is, then that means the people who are in charge are not the right people to be there but they do not have the knowledge of how to use the resources that are available to them. We knew far more than they know in science today. I'm just going to touch, I'm just going to throw this out here to whet your appetite a little bit. The Monuments of Mars by Hoagland. Get a copy of that and read it. About the Viking missions. The pictures taken there. Where they find pyramids and sphinxes on Mars dating some 500,000 years ago. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to mess with it anymore. What I'm trying to say is this, not any spookism, but there is a level of consciousness and understanding that we are supposed to have as a people that is far beyond anything we know today. We were plugged into something. They're still walking around trying to figure out the mystery of the pyramid. We had figured it out. We built it. The Japanese, who are the greatest technicians on the earth today, tried to rebuild a thing and have never been able to succeed, according to the specification. But it was more than a physical thing. They don't understand that. There's a whole cosmic hookup. You talk, when you're talking about the building of these great monuments, you're talking about a connection with the whole solar system of the universe. These folk were tuned in to something. When you see the circle with the dot in the middle of it, that was a simplification of the most profound thing there is. All and in all, it's in this dot in the center of the universe. Yes, and that encompasses everything. Everything. That too is connected with the body of woman. Oh, 
the divine vortex. The vortex that is everywhere. In a hurricane, in a storm. The divine vortex, that's a whole nother system of study in itself. In sharing these things with you, I'm just hoping that you don't say, oh man, I don't feel like being bothered with this. This is, you know, why, what, what good is it going to do? It's going to do a lot of good to open your brain up further so that you won't have to struggle as much in life. I mean that. When you come to a certain level of consciousness, you would relieve a lot of burdens. Having come to this knowledge about the black woman took a lot of burdens off of my male chauvinistic self. I'm able to appreciate my woman better, get along with her better, and feel stronger as a result of it. No, I haven't wimped out. I will never wimp out. I can't. And that's not what the black woman wants. She doesn't want to wimp. Now, some of them say they got a wimping train. Once they wimp him out, they get tired of him. They go on to somebody else. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. Recognizing her as the queen of the universe does not diminish me in any way. Because in so doing, I didn't have the power to be the king. She makes me so. And she wants to look up to you as that. She, she want, that's what she wants. So she can be free to go on about the business of civilization that she has to do. She's still the salvation of civilization, even though they tried to reduce her down to daytime soap operas and all that stuff. That's not you. Your mind's supposed to be operating on a higher level. It used to operate on a higher level. When they wanted to know something, all over the world, they went to the oracle. Who was the oracle? Black woman sitting over water, running water. Always had to have some running water. Deep running water. Sitting over some running water. Tell you what you need to know. <laughs> Excuse me. I, in my own personal life, I, and I dedicate, uh, one of my dedications is a book to mother, the Reverend Mother Susie Tate. Saved my life on many occasions. Black woman, could see things. Told me, called me up, said, boy, what you doing is going to get you hurt. And I went and checked it out, and Lord, I'd be escaped just by the skin of my teeth. Now, our system of belief is not the same. <coughs> Excuse me. But that doesn't matter with me. It had nothing to do with that. She is tapped into something in the universe. I don't care whether I understand it or not. It saved my behind. That's the final, that's the, the bottom line there. And I appreciate that. So in understanding that and giving that kind of glory, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught that, as long as you respect your woman, the world will respect you as a man. If they can disrespect your woman, then they will never respect you. The white man don't even want the white woman, but he demands that everybody what? Respects her. He doesn't even respect her himself. Keeps her up under him. Beats her down. See how they're fighting for women's rights? Because he won't treat her right. But he demands that everybody else, even if he thought you were looking at her, which I didn't want to know. But he thought you were looking at her. Killing people. Emmett Till and all that. Because he thought he whistled at some white woman. He don't even want her himself. He's so busy running around here trying to get black women and other women of color if he ain't trying to plug one another in the butt. So that, I mean, I'm talking about his culture, the Greek culture, which he claims to be the basis of civilization. That's what their whole culture was about. They didn't want nothing to do with no women. The only reason why they went with women, because that's the only way you can have babies. And you remember if you ever read Lisa Strata, the women told the men that they were going to never have access to the bed again. Therefore, they would be cut off from their immortality through their children if they didn't stop fighting one another and hanging out there in them tents, plugging one another and come home and deal with them. If you've ever read the story of Lisa Strada, that's exactly what it says. Dr. Uh, Francis Wilson, with her fine self, said that uh, black women ought to adapt that method, that if you won't stand up for the defense of this people, and you won't stand up and be a man, I'm going to cross my legs and not uncross them until you do. <laughs> that make a lot of cats straighten up. <laughs> I'm coming down. I said I was going to make this short so we could have question and answer. Rhapsody for the glorious queen of heaven. Oh, man, it's not no new thing that sisters love to hear the good rap. You just got to be sincere with it, brothers. They have always loved to hear it. And they always love to hear it because brothers used to spend a lot of time. When you read the Song of Solomon, that's a black man talking to a black woman. They spent a lot of time rhapsodizing to this woman, making songs about her. Of all of the images found in the world, there are far more female images than there are male images. Why? 
He was preoccupied with the glory of this woman. I would be too. Somebody saved my butt, keep me from having to fight a lion every day, feed me, sit me on a throne, show me how to build a pyramid, give me mathematics, make life good for me, happy for me, perfume it up, dust it up with incense, feed me all this good food. Yeah, I sing to it too. And that's why they sang to her and rhapsodized to her. And that's why I named this uh, Rhapsody for the Glorious Queen of Heaven. One of the uh, symbols of the, among the many, the wisdom knot was one. That's why tying the knot in marriage and all that, it's supposed to be hooked in with wisdom. I go into it in the book. One was the horn. And you see many images of African women uh, 30, 20, 40,000 years ago with horns on them. And white folks coming out, they don't know what they're looking at. This is a grotesque looking thing. Uh, it wasn't for the people who did it and knew what they were doing, what the imagery stood for. It was a symbol of the fact that she was the first domesticator of animals. The first domesticator of animals. And the fact that also she used those horns to carry the potions that she mixed medicine in because she was the first doctor. She was the first healer. She was the first one to say, come here, baby, let me deal with that cut on you. She still do it today, don't she? When you come home and you hurt, who do you go to? Who takes care of that? And when you need comfort real bad, where do you lay your head? If, you ha if you're lucky enough, that's what you do. Because there's no greater comfort than that in all the world. It's a healing in just that act. Just to lay your head in her bosom takes a lot of anxiety and frustration off of you. True, that's reciprocal. She comes and lays her head in your chest to take anxiety and frustration. We know it goes both ways. It was understood that way. The uh, African man and the African woman ruled the world together. Jointly. They were not in competition until this cracker came and confused up everybody. And one of the things I think happened, and I'm coming to a close, I am, is that because the, the male, the African male, was the front line of defense in most cases. I said they had some warrior queens that could whip the male's behind. Because he was the front line of defense, and he was constantly fighting this, because white folk couldn't stop fighting. He was a relentless uh, uh, animal, as President Imari calls him. He was a relentless animal. He likes to fight all the time. His whole religion was based off of fighting. His religious image was based around dying and fighting. It's heaven, Valhalla, where you fought all day long, and then you drank beer all night long. <laughs> Who wants a heaven like that? The Muslim heaven was you got 72 virgins <laughs> at death and you enjoyed the pleasures of the divine black woman through all eternity. You know, that was their concept. I like their heaven better than I like uh, Valhalla. And that was built on another concept there. The, his whole thing was fighting. So in his society, it was the male who ruled and through constantly coming in contact with him, the male somehow, the African male, many began now to abuse the power of their brute strength and to subdue women. And in the beginning of that was one of the beginning of the downfall of African civilizations. The fact that Hatshepsut had to pass herself off as a man showed that that society was in trouble. Why? Women had ruled on the throne before then. That empire had been around for a long time and they had ruled on it. What was the problem? They were ruling further south in Kush. The Kandakis were. What was the problem there? That meant that they had been around or in contact with those Eurasians too long. And they were beginning to be influenced by that. But even at that, the throne still represented the lap of Aset. She was still the source of power. And all pharaohs wanted to marry whether they were indigenous Africans themselves, which most of them were, or not, they figured the thing which secured their power on the throne and gave them the contact with the spiritual knowledge they need was to marry a woman from where? The South. That's right, the Ethiopian, the Kushite woman, because she had that special insight, that clairvoyance, that connection with the spirits that not, no one else on earth had. That was SA5, SA6, black woman, the promogenial bird of paradise.
the black woman was associated with birds because it was said that her influence over the men in her life, all of them, was always ethereal. Her influence in a given situation would take men higher and higher in their level of consciousness. So as they sat down to settle a dispute or settle a problem with that elevated way of thinking, they would be most less likely to go to war with one another and to draw blood. She was the one who did that, and she became known as the bird of paradise. And I go into the detail why she was associated with birds. Why the English still call them, and although it's uh, out of context, they still call them women what? Birds. That bird. But it comes from an old African tradition. In fact, in those days, to call a woman a cow or a heifer was a compliment. You do that today, and she's going to war with you. They're going to pull some hair. But back in those days, it was a compliment because the symbolism was, was different. My, how things have changed. Essay 7, the role of angels in the last rite of passage, which is misnomer of death. I do not believe in death, personally. I'm not telling you what you have to believe in. I just believe it's a transition from one form of life to another. I believe that based on the fact that Africans seem to have believed that from time immemorial. So that's the most stable thing I can think of. Actually, nobody really knows, I don't think, what happens beyond that, but they seem to have had a greater understanding than anyone else did at the time, or have had since. I believe when someone asks me to do a funeral, I don't do funerals. I do a celebration of life. A celebration of life, the joy of life, the celebration of that person. And we notice that when many of the pharaohs were buried, and you'll see it in the illustrations here. Oh yes, here it is, plate uh, eight. Here's a coffin of Seti I. This is an image of Nuit, the queen of heaven, laying over top of him. Some of them even had an image in the bottom of the coffin. They wanted to be surrounded. They wanted this woman with them throughout eternity, all around them. That was a symbol of, I always want to be in harmony with the divine cosmic feminine spirit in the universe. I don't want to ever be separated from that. It was the thing that brought me here, when I leave here, obviously it must be some connection that I connect, reconnect with that once again. That was their uh, system of belief. And of course, the last essay, which is actually a preview of African Genesis and Historical Reality, which I uh, delineate the chapters in that forthcoming work. Uh, we have uh, the catalog for our tapes and other books in here as well. And that kind of gives you a general uh, overview of African woman, the original guardian angel. Now, brothers and sisters, I hope I have some time to share with you in terms of question and answer. Well, let me ask you this. What do you think of the idea, the concept, the, 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 the work so far? All right. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. I just want to be sure, I was, I was just trying to do the right thing. I just want to be sure I did the right thing. <laughs> Are there any questions, uh, and, uh, any questions or comments? Yes, my sister. What is Maya Thuna? Maya Thuna, all right, is the practice of the Kemetan priest where in the act of copulation with the woman, which is the only way that Africans would copulate with a woman, you used a element of the mind over the body and the spiritual energy over the body to control the male to control himself and to reserve what they call reserve his ejaculation he could do that indefinitely in doing that he would absorb the energy of the female because each time she would rise to higher levels through her orgasm, it took her on another spiritual level, and he could receive that energy from her body, from her very essence, her being. And each time that energy would come to him, it would take him to a higher level of consciousness, and he would be further enlightened. So they practiced that of, of withholding as long as some of them could do it, as I said, indefinitely so that they would be able to bring her the total joy that she was able to experience and to receive that spiritual energy from them. this. Uh, this was a part of their meditation practice as well. 
they are said to have been able to achieve some phenomenal feats after an encounter. the best. One of the elements uh, that uh, Dr. Sterling Stuckey points out, brings home so well, is that the thing that hurt the African slaves more than anything else, and there was so much to hurt us in that whole situation, was the fact that he was a man that was so much lower than him intellectually and in terms of, 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 of development, of civilization, culturally. He was so far beneath him and yet he was enslaving him. That was the most hurtful thing. Everything that the slave masters learned and acquired, they acquired from the slave. And turned around and said, we did this to you so that we could save you from uh, uh, ignorance and barbarity and cannibalism. We brought you over here to Christianize you and to serve us so you could learn to grow up to be real human beings when actually in terms of learning it was just the opposite. They learned it was, and the thing that kept us in that, that got us in that situation, and that's a simple, this is a rather simple definition because that's a complex question. How did we get into it? Is our inability, in spite of all of our ancient wisdom and high learning and understanding, our inability to understand just what type of creature we were dealing with. And we still don't know today exactly what we're dealing with because we often act like. He never did any of these things. Yes, my sister. I've been doing a lot of study for the last four years, books on top of books. And this is a conclusion that I came to. It's not that we didn't understand. It's just that we didn't have that brutal force just to kill at will. And we still hold it today. Even though some of us begin to learn about religions, how we got trapped in certain religions because I was doing research on Peru. And when they went into Peru as slaves, they were handed a Bible with a necklace and told them they were Christians. But they didn't want them to, to mingle with the Muslims because the Muslims had a different belief. But I, we are still hung up on that brute force. But we can go to Vietnam. We can, I just went to see Glory of the Night, that big war picture they're talking about, a beautiful picture, where they could die uh, in the army. But we don't have that brute force to go out and kill at will. Now, we had possessed that kill at will and not be merciful. As we have been taught from babies, we've always taught to be merciful. And this has been one of our downfalls, but I don't know how long it's going to last, this Christianity move that we have. Because just like I'm figuring out, because I don't even know, that even though I know my parents were given the Bible, I don't know whether I could walk up and kill a person at will. You know, and snap a finger, like I know you're not like me and I got to get rid of you. Because we have compassion. And maybe this, it's not the idea that we have been put in this role. Maybe we have, we have a, a, a race to run. And when you have a race to run to prove something, the Creator has put us in this predicament that we must prove something. I don't know what it is. I'm, I'll be going on, and my grandchildren will be going through it. But we have to run this race and go through and be merciful 
to these people who we know are brutalizing our mothers and we know they have cut the, the babies out of the womb in slavery time and have brutalized us. Maybe this is a, it's all like a game that we must go through. This is the summary that I have, because when you can kill at will, like I say, some people say mental game, like you can give, you can form a world as you want in your mind. We have been put in this predicament. We're going to get out of it, but we, it's something we have to prove. It has to be given to humanity. That's an interesting observation. I do have to raise the question of this. If we don't have the ability to kill at will, how come we are destroying each other so in our communities today? That's a question that comes to mind. We seem to have the ability, I mean not only here but on the continent. There are many Africans who just seem to love shedding African blood. So obviously that ability must exist to some degree. It just has to be redirected. That, that's the point. Um, true, they have taken advantage of our capacity to love. But now, at some point, after all of this experience with them, just the very basic common sense says to us, if you, when you love this man, he hurts you. At some point, you have to come to the parting of the ways. A lot of that is also based on the condition, and we didn't feel that way about it. They didn't just come get us, and we came over here willingly. That was a hard fight and struggle. The difference was, it seems, historically, is that we never knew how strong his forces were or were capable of being. He was always insignificant to us, and we fought him by and large mostly tribally rather than nationally, although some of us did, like the Mazi nation and the, uh, the uh, Shanti were the last to go down. They put forth the most valiant efforts. So there are a lot of ramifications connected with that, and we'll probably be going on for ages trying to figure out what. There's no simple way. I just suggested that one of the things is our failure to perceive what kind of person we're dealing with. We think that somehow through this religion or that religion or through our influence, we can transform this person. I like that song that Doug and Gene Kahn used to do. I thought, uh, I thought that I could change a thing that was not real. I gave to it my life and my time, but oh, how bad it made me feel. And then he goes on to say, but then a thought came down like a light to my brain of revelation. You cannot change the nature of a thing. And his nature, as Dia points out, is shaping in ice. Something whose nature is shaping in ice, you cannot change it to a tropical nature. That's the way that they are. They go to tropical lands and still act like ice men. I'm not saying that to be hateful. And you're right, there is a certain characteristic of us that we cannot allow to die. That's our humanity. We cannot allow a bloodlust to come. Yet there is, as the scripture says, a time to live and a time to kill. And we are, if, since we got so much energy to kill one another, let's take that energy and kill the person who's responsible for your situation. Yes, my sister. Our oh. power is in our thought. What we think is what we are. We can kill with our minds. Uh, we can kill our self-esteem. Our enemies. We can kill with our minds. We can kill ourselves and kill our enemies. We don't know our power, like you said, because we lost a lot of it. We definitely have the power. Since we have the power, we don't know where that energy comes from. The woman who we said saw what she saw to, to save him. It's there for us, but we're so loud, we don't have time to think. All that is, we, we each all have energy. They have it too. And it's mind over power. <laughs> mind over matter. Every last one of us have it. They have it. But because we are supposed to be highly spiritual people, we're not using it. We're making too much noise. And we have to sit That's down exactly and be the point. quiet. Our children, we, you know, our children are being ruined. And uh, <clears throat> television, and we don't spend time as families like we should. But we all have the power to destroy, and it's all begins, it all begins in the mind. And we, I remember during the time of the Civil Rights Movement when Martin Luther King was killed, they were so frightened. That was one of the strongest periods I remember in the 60s, 65, 66, I can't remember exactly. They were really frightened. They were frightened of us because we were very shy, we were angry. And that's when, I remember, I remember I used to ride the trains, the ENF, and the majority of people at the time, they were Caucasian. They were, they were scared stiff. They were really scared. I never seen so much frightening. Because I remember time there was, there was a time when they would go along and they would pat you on your, on your rear end. And they thought nothing of it. And I think after that period they decided to keep their hands to themselves. But it's our minds. We can see whatever we want to see. We can train our minds to see it. What many singers are saying today is what we see up here. Sometimes we can't be deceived as all of us weren't given 
we're given the power to see things spiritually, but sometimes it's off. But it's what it's what uh, what we see up here is what we can make it. One writer and has it's the truth. I know because. One writer has stated uh, succinctly that uh, true education is the harmonious balance of the mental, the spiritual, and the physical. There must always be a balance. The mind, I think, of all of those elements is probably the most important. And if that is developed well, then the physical and the spiritual will fall in line. There are times when you have to physically destroy if something threatens you. The times when you can do it mentally, there's times you can do it spiritually. You have to be able to function at, at doing what you have to do when you have to do it. The main thing is not so much that we have to destroy them as we have to prevent them from destroying us. You brought up a point there that's very important to me, and I mentioned it in the book, that in our communities, there's so much, often, so many of our communities, there's uh, often just too much agitation and noise. And the, the, the mind cannot think and be analytical with that kind of noise. And they know that. That's why they keep it pumped in. This is the first time in the history of our music that I know of. I'm 51 years old. It's the first time that I've ever heard black people listen to the same beat over, over again with every record and think it's a different song. This is the first time I've ever heard, uh, I've, uh, heard every singer just about sound the same, with the exception of maybe Anita Baker or someone else. Most everyone sounds the same. The melody sounds the same. The beat sounds. Now, what state do you, what state of euphoria do you have a people in that they'll be listening to this and think they're hearing different music? These are some of the questions we have to ask ourselves. Uh, I've been focusing on the front and neglecting these people in the back. Please help me, Fritz. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank you for putting that information together because it's a jewel in the crown. And uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to say to the sister also that um, I believe that we are going through, uh, we were put here in this position so that we could learn the negative side of life. We have to learn the full extent of the negative side of life because I believe when we first broke our own laws, that's what put, put us in here. So we had to learn the negative side of life so that when we come back on top, we'll never break our laws again. Um, I'd like to um, ask you a question. Um, Can I comment on that a minute before the question? Sure. <clears throat> that's an interesting view. I'm not so sure that we were put in it. This is just my opinion. As I look at it historically, strictly as a scientist. We were warned time and time again by our elders, by our uh, uh, oracles, not to let this man in our land. We were warned over and over again. The Greeks were not allowed, nor the Persians were allowed to come and study in Kemet for thousands of years. It was only during the time of Amos II that he permitted them to come in. And now began the beginning of the downfall of Kemet. We were told not to. What we did was overextended. This is one man's opinion. Our capacity for love. Now it's just like a woman or a man. When a person keeps mistreating you, but you keep hanging on saying, I love you anyhow. Somebody tell you, say, and, can, and you can see the sign, say, if you give this person your heart, they're going to hurt you. They're going to drag you through the mud and debase you. Say, but I got to do it. Seemed like we were that way with this dude. I got to do it anyhow. We were warned, and in many respects, understand me now, I'm just, my opinion, we are responsible for our condition. I'm not taking away from him what he did. But had we listened, and then Alex Haley said the two bob, keep away from the two bob. If we'd stayed away from the two bob, kept the two bob away from us, then perhaps we wouldn't have been in this condition. Or at least if you were dealt with him, know what you were dealing with. But we kept thinking, and we still think that all this cat has to do is stand up and talk softly, cry through, and don't let him say in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's all up. We're going to believe every word he says. <laughs> and promise anything, and we say, well, he's changed. Things and people don't change like that. A change is a long process. A nature just doesn't change overnight just simply by will. I want to change. Even if he wants to, he can't do it like that. He needs guidance. He needs rehabilitation process and all that. But you accept him. We accept him at face value. That's what I'm talking about when I raise that up. 
Yeah. Well, you know, when I said uh, we broke our own laws, that meant also the law of reciprocity. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. So, therefore, if you break your own law, you got a penalty to pay. So this is part of our penalty. I, I don't think that we're going to ever make this mistake again. I agree with you. I don't think so. Um, my, my other question was um, on the male and female principle. Right? At one time, you know, you said that they both were together. Uh, what caused the split? And the second part to that question is... Let me deal with the first part. Okay. Let me deal with a little bit of time. All right. Now, trying to answer that, it's like trying to answer the question, if black people were so great in the past, then what happened? I mean, that's a complex question. You can only answer it in part. And you, know, you can only express an opinion. My opinion, based on my studies and research, is that when the Eurasians were able to conquer our lands and to exert an influence over us, and we began to take on their ways, that's when the split came. When our kings and rulers began to marry outside of the race and marry women of other races, that's when that breakdown came about. Because the connection between the African and his woman was far more than just a domestic connection. It was a, 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 a deep, spiritual, cosmic connection. She was the sustaining force that kept him hooked into the divine intelligence. She was that, that special. He could only be king and be a ruler with her. So when he no longer was connected with, with that source, the black woman, and he began to go with other women and take them in as queen, they did not have that power. They did not have that insight. They did not have that spiritual connection because they were not the original woman. So they could not fulfill his need. Therefore, he began to degenerate in his understanding and his method of rule, which affected the whole entire society in time. That's one of the ways I believe that split began to move in. And the patrilineal system began to ease in over the matrilineal. When they embraced the patrilineal system, as the Hebrews did, who were originally an African people, and many of uh, 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 some of the Kemetan uh, 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 tribes and groups did, then there was a whole degeneracy of the culture itself. It was the beginning of the, of the end for them. Because the matrilineal system had within it those principles that not only sustained you, but kept you evolving to higher levels of being. Mm -hmm. That's what our research reveals thus far. Mm -hmm. Well, um, with the Hebrew, they, it, it seems that when you begin to that study of it, right, you'll find out that they had the uh, female principle too. Yes, they would say the that yes. they would say that the Most High is the male generative principle, and then they would say that Israel itself. <laughs> is the female principle because they would have something called the Shekinah, which was the female principle. Yeah, and, they, and they attached that to the whole nation of Israel. They also spoke of wisdom as being uh, the breath of God, uh, which is the power of God. They spoke mm -hmm. of wisdom as a female, mm -hmm. you know, the right. same way as the Kemetan. So, the, you know, so the, the, the principle is still, still there. But, I mean, once these Europeans got hold to it, it corrupted. They put the male above the right. female instead of putting them as equal. Now, um, from what you see, do you see that we're evolving back, or are we starting that upward arc back to the male, to the female principle? Yes. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. I'm, uh, yes, I'm glad you, you raised that too, because it is not by accident that this type of research is going on now. It really isn't. Uh, that so many Afrocentric scholars are moving in this direction. Not only Afrocentric scholars, many European scholars have moved in that direction. That is the age. Dr. Charles Finch spoke about that the other day. I was uh, watching him on For the People. And he was saying on one of the tapes I have of For the People I was listening to, he said there are certain ages that the earth goes through. We are now in the age where the female is coming back into her own, which is the forerunner to the earth being harmonized once again. So that knowledge that Afrocentric scholars are coming to, and we all seem to be coming to it, we can be in different places around the world, and we're arriving at the same point about the African female. It's a key. Even Dick Gregory, I think he went, he may have went a bit I don't know. He, some of the statements that people said he said, because I didn't hear him say it, were a bit far-fetched to, to me. But he has stated that this is the time of the female for the woman to come back into power. Now, that doesn't mean that males should get afraid and, and cower down. When it says she comes back into power, that's when we come back into power, because we definitely are not in power. And keeping her down doesn't keep us in power. For sure, that doesn't work.
because we are as powerless as we can be, her coming back into power will set the balance straight, then she puts us on the throne again. But we can't get on that throne again until she gets it back, because she is the throne. She is the power source. It's hard for me to explain now. Read the book. It goes into what the whole complexity of the throne and what it meant to the ruler as a representative of his mother. And she was the source of his power. And when we say his mother, we're talking about the collective motherhood of black women itself. So to answer your question briefly, yes, I believe we are coming back to that. I believe it, it is time for that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yes, my brother. I'm sorry. You've been, you've had your, will someone else please handle this? Because I'll be looking in those seats sometimes. And I do not want to offend or overlook anyone, and especially this brother. <laughs> yeah, I've made several calls, you know, on um, WWRL. I even mentioned your name to First World to have you down there, but it seemed as though, uh, you know, even trying with all my effort, wasn't successful. I don't know for what reason. Um, one correction, then I'd like to ask a question in that um, the connotation slave and master, you know, somebody I kind of feel offended about the term slave and master. I think one uh, brother put it correctly that we were prisoners of war and put into a slave like condition. I think it's only um, psychologically or mentally when you accept. Um, the slave-like condition, then you can, one can define you as a slave, but they will always revolt. And then to even call him a master, you know, over us. I still don't, he's never a master over us. So that relation of slave and master, I think they have to be corrected in the future. Um, I think it should be corrected now. It's a very valid point. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm glad you did bring it up because normally mm. I will paraphrase that by saying so-called or something like that. Right. Normally I would because I don't accept those terms either. I have no master but myself. Uh, and that, that, that's it. I mean, for, for in terms of um, somebody brought up a question in terms of we have the, the capacity mentally to, to defend ourselves but if that cannot be transformed into something physical, then it will stay in, you know, you will be em embodying the thought and it just stays there. For instance, Nat Turner, I mean, he had the idea, but then he executed the, the, the thought process that he had in terms of what he did. However, I noticed that a lot of um, ministers who never raised Nat Turner to a level of adoration, because what he did, in fact, was to... Um, get Virginia as a place of freedom for African people, not by method of negotiation, because you couldn't negotiate with those people. You had to kill white people, and this is exactly what he did. But you don't find, you know, I go all around asking people, do you know anything about Nat Turner? No, I don't know anything about Nat Turner. Nat Turner should be raised to a pedestal where we, we honor him in terms of what he did. That's one thing. I'll, fi I'll finish it right Let me now. Speak to that a moment. Uh. Nat Turner not only frightened white people; he frightened black people. Mm. They had been, uh, as, uh, as uh, Brother Farrakhan says, they had been praying for him. They didn't know what they were praying for. And when he came, he was so ferocious, which was what it, what it called for. That's what the situation called for. Mm -hmm. He was so ferocious. He frightened not only the white man; he frightened black That's people. That's correct. It is our duty, those of us who know about Nat Turner, to Keep him before the people. I mean, if they can keep telling me about George Washington and Patrick Henry and all these people who had no problem killing who they thought were their overlords, the British, certainly we should not be ashamed of someone who had us in bondage, more so than King George had them in bondage, who had us in bondage killing those who were lording over him so they could have his freedom. So, yes, we should uphold him before our children, and we should keep it ever before the people as often as we can. Okay, um, uh, the question kind of slipped me now, but, um, oh yes, just before I came here, because I know I had this question to ask you, I always read um, Paul's message to the Corinthian. okay? And, you know, people read it, but they accept the writings, just literally because I understand that they're converted as true believers, okay? But the point is this is that 
Why was it important for Paul to try to, to bring this new philosophy among a people? Why was it necessary? You see, and I have a problem in terms of that because it, was, it seemed to be like a new doctrine that was being popularized by Paul and attacking another people for their belief. So I have, you know, whoever wrote it, you know, most of those writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, uh, you talk to people and they say that they were inspired. I say, well, Reverend Barashango was inspired to write too. Oh, but he's not a divine person. I don't understand that. I said, Dr. Ben was inspired to write too. Oh, but he's not a divine person. You know, these men were inspired to write. I, I don't know if you could deal with... Well, in terms <laughs> of uh, Christianity, it actually should be called Paulinism because it had nothing to do with Christ or, or the Krishna as a, as a proper term or the anointed one. Uh, the, the Jesus himself, if he were to come back to the world today, would not, if you ask him was he a Christian, he would be totally, uh, you know, he would be a miss. He wouldn't know what you were talking about. You know, what does that mean? Because he didn't found Christianity. Uh, he founded a political party called the Nazarene Party. And his whole objective was political. Uh, that is because their, spiritu their spirituality and their politics were one and the same. Their religion and their politics were one and the same. Liberation was a sacred uh, uh, commission from God to, to liberate the people. That was the most sacred thing that could be done. So that, that's, what, that's what the historical Jesus was about now. The, the fantasy duty of Christian mythology is another thing. And it was Paul who devised and developed these doctrines. Uh, the basic ones. Actually, the rest of them were devised by the European church fathers of Christianity. Uh, they kept adapting and, and uh, corrupting and co-opting what they could from the other doctrines, particularly from the uh, uh, Book of the Coming Forth by day and by night, what, what little they could understand. And they kept adopting these things and putting them in there. Even to the point, to give you an example, a case in point, of the um, African, ancient Africans' reverence for the uh, black woman. How she was put on such a high pedestal of life, so to speak, uh, the, not that she was untouchable, I don't mean it that way, but she was revered, right, almost to the point of worship, even though uh, uh, European Roman Catholics are essentially uh, male chauvinistic and are patrilineal in their approach to life, they still have maintained, to some degree, the worship of the mother goddess in Mary. Because Mary is merely all set transmogrified into the European, and not always European, because in most of the European churches, the icons that are most uh, precious to them are the ones of the black Madonna and child, which is a throwback to way back a couple of million, a thousand years, 200,000 years ago, when the Madonna and child was worshipped, the black woman and the child which she produced. I mean, this was the most marvelous thing that could be done in the world. So they're telling you this in essence, with this Madonna concept. This is the way they would co-opt it and, and misuse it and abuse it. So that's what happened in case of Christianity. Uh, historically speaking, there's a book I worked on and I, I got about three quarters of the way through it and I've never finished and I will one day. Black Historical Facts on the Life of Jesus. I've been working on that for I don't know how long. Well, it explains that very clearly. There's one chapter in there entitled, How Jesus Became God. I mean, Jesus was not God while he was here. Nobody thought of him as being God while he was here. Yeah, well, that, that's because for 300 years later, they decided that's what he was going to be. And he wasn't there to say anything about it. They needed a savior God, and they, they had never had one. So they, that was the one, and they took and Europeanized him. So that's how the thing came about. And I, I, once again, as I said, I'm not attacking anyone's system of belief, but Christianity as we know it is totally out of the context of the intent of Jesus or his disciples. And Paul wasn't connected with either of them. He never saw Jesus, and he did not, he went against the consent of the disciples, as a matter of fact. And that's where the old adage came from, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Because that's exactly what he did. That's just to give an example. Yes, I guess I should be winding down now, It's because I know it's, it's getting late, and people need to go home. Um, I'll stay as long as you want me to, but I don't want to uh, impose on your time, so I guess a few more questions and we can close out. Yes. I'd, I'd like to take the question back to Christianity because I think it's a big boogaboo that should be busted wide open. And in terms of, um, of, of uh, Jesus, right, being um, a rebel of the state, right, and in the manner in which he was killed, 
and then Paul coming along and seeing that, right? He, is, is it possible that he figured that he would change up the strategy and say, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to take it to the Gentiles and let the Gentiles help us raise up? Because I think if you read from Romans 9 to 11, he lays out a strategy where it looks like they, he's trying to trick them. But Paul, oh, all right, let me deal with that historically since you brought it up. Paul was a brother on an ego trip. And while I'm on that, let me mention, as we studied the files of the COINTELPRO program and how they were so effective in breaking up many of the black organizations, we found out the reason why they were so effective in it is because they could play up on brothers' misplaced egos. And many of the struggles we became involved in with each other were, were ego struggles. And when, when we were not willing to come to grips with our own idiosyncrasies, we would splinter off from the group so that we wouldn't have to be confronted with it anymore and do our own thing. And so they came in and said, your group is more important than that group, and they turned one on the other. Paul was suffering from that. Paul was a little short, uncomely looking, long-nosed. Now, I'm not picking on anybody long and long nose is all right. He was a black man. But he, he, was, he, was, he was somewhat disfigured, Hebrew. He couldn't get a woman. He had trouble with women. He was a misogynist. He hated women. It was Paul that wrote, let the women keep silent in the church. Why, if black people practiced that today, you wouldn't have any church. <laughs> the women raised the money and everything to keep the church going. Um, he came up with all the slaves obey your masters, all that kind of stuff. Paul wanted to be who... Jesus was, and his name wasn't Jesus, his name was Yeshua. There's nobody in history named Jesus. That's uh, a, a, a Latinized form of it. Uh, Yeshua, uh, 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 in, a, in a Greek, uh, Gre Greco-Romanized version of it, right? The name was Yeshua, a Hebrew, Yeshua. Yeshua ben Joseph of the house of Panther. Black Panther, that, that's another story. I'm serious, I can tell you where to find that thing. Paul wanted that attention, that the, the messianic attention that was given to him. And then the disciples having all this excitement and this following and everything. He wanted that, but he wasn't a good speaker for one thing. You remember on one occasion in Acts, he was speaking so long, a man fell out the loft and died. <laughs> and he said himself, which was in Colossians, that he couldn't speak well. But he knew seven languages. He was probably the only disciple that could write. It's doubtful whether Peter and the rest of them could write. We know that uh, Yeshua was not literate in that sense. So his ability to write, his ability to travel, coming from a relatively rich background of the Sanhedrin, a member of the Sanhedrin Council, his parents were, coming from a rich background, he was able to cover more ground than they could. They were stuck in Jerusalem. He was running to Rome and to Corinth and to Colossus and Thessalonica and everywhere. So he could spread his thing <laughs> where they were somewhat localized. Paul was on an ego trip mission. And what happened is when Christianity, or Nazareanism, because it wasn't Christianity, received the death knell blow, because Christianity was of no significance. When they talk about uh, Nero and all of them burning the Christians. They were not burning Christians. They were burning Nazareans. They were, they were trying to root out this political party. They were like the Panthers. And the symbol was a black, black panther, by the way. If you want to question me on that, you can. 2,000 years ago, there ain't nothing new. <laughs> no new thing. And they were trying to root them out. They devastated them so that now when they came back, the, the remnant that came out that the, of the Europeans who had embraced the philosophy, they now embraced what was called Christianity and this new savior God that Paul had presented. And they dug up his writings, which had almost been, uh, you know, considered as obsolete. They had been uh, cast aside for some time. And in their desperation, in 140 of the Common Era, when John Marcion had this desperation to develop a Christian scripture, because he did not agree with the Yahweh of the Old Testament, this God of war and everything. He wanted a more tender, feminine God. He came up with 13 uh, books of uh, letters of Paul, as they said, and this Gospel of Luke is what he introduced. They didn't even have the four Gospels there. They took four out of 70 of them, of 70 biographies on the life of Jesus. That's how the whole 
concept and why Paul has such an influence on Christianity. And that was European Christianity. There was a great deal of difference between that and the Christianity of Africa. Uh, the the fathers, uh, founding fathers of that being Origen and Cipriani, uh, Tertullian and, and, and St. Augustine and, and folk like that, and Perpetua and, uh, and a host of others there. Okay, a couple of more questions. Yeah, I wanted to um, ask you in um, relationship to, uh, like, say, the Nazareans, right, as opposed to, like, the writings of Paul, um, how, how much time elapsed between that and the um, Nicene Council or Constantine, and, and how did that change? I mean, was there a belief that um, Christ was a deity in between the times of the writing of, of, of Paul and, and the um, uh, crystallization of Christianity with um, Constantine? There were so many, there were about as many different denominational concepts of Christianity and Jesus back then as there is today. They used to go into the arenas and kill each other over these different doctrines and these different writings and so forth. That's why they decided at the Council of Nicaea to have a unified code of the system of belief. Because Constantine saw that the Roman Empire had invested so much time and energy in trying to stamp this thing out, and the more it did, the more expensive it became. He said the best thing to do is co-opt it. And his mother had become converted to it. So he said, well, that's what we will do. But I want you to come together at Nicaea, and I want you to decide what the doctrine will be. When that's settled, I will back it up with my army. That's when this thing, the sword and the cross, came out. I will back it up with my army. That's how the thing came out. What people believe about Christianity, about Jesus being different, because they fought over that for years. As to whether he was God, or whether he was a divinity, or whether he was a mere man, or whether he was born of a virgin in terms of a woman who had never been touched by a man. That struggle went on for hundreds and for centuries. But it was because the armies of Rome won out that the doctrines that people believe in Christianity today exist. It has nothing at all to do with Jesus or really even Paul. They just used the Paul writings, Paul writings and re-edited them because they were the ones that could be closely, more closely modified to what they wanted to espouse as a belief system. So that's how it came about. So what people believe today was not decided when Jesus was alive. That's what I want to make clear. It was decided some 300 years later. And then it wasn't completely decided. They kept having councils and synods and all those things. And it wasn't up until perhaps just about the 15th century that they had some definite system of belief that we're going to follow. It went on time. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, actually explain the Kemetic cosmological creation make the African woman an angel? Oh, of course. In the Kemetic cosmogony, as with all the ancient cosmogonies, cosmogony meaning the uh, creation of the world, the study of, of the creation of the world,